66% of all U.S. households, that's 87 million homes, own a pet. Americans spend $136 billion a year on these treasured creatures, $490 million on their Halloween costumes alone. Just one $500 trip to the vet would put over 40% of all pet owners into debt. How did America become a pet-owning country? What do pets provide to humans that fellow humans can't? Today, I am pleased to welcome Warren Eckstein, a world-renowned pet behaviorist and animal trainer, the former petologist of the Today Show, to talk about the psychology and practicality of pets. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. I hope that you are having a great week. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can be sure to, to stay notified every time I have a duly noted news segment come out or a Timeless episode coming out. So today, yes indeed, we are talking about pets. Now full disclosure, I told Warren this before the episode, I don't own a pet. I never have. I'm allergic, sadly, to most animals, but maybe by the end of the program today, Warren will convince me to get a pet that will be friendly to my allergies. Warren, thank you so much for coming on to the program. So glad to be with you, Julie. So are there possible pets I could get that are not dogs yeah. that could be good for me? Yeah, there, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. For example, if you really want a dog and you have allergies, first of all, get rid of the carpeting in your house. Get rid of drapes. Make your house allergy-free. Oh. That makes all the difference in the world. And there are certain breeds. There's no such thing as the total allergy-free dog. But, you know, breeds like poodles and Portuguese water dogs. And the reason for that is those are the breeds that don't have fur. A poodle doesn't have fur. That's why you got to cut the hair all the time. It's hair versus fur. So if you get a dog with hair, you're a lot less apt to have allergies. And also, most people are not allergic to the fur or the hair. It's the dander. So making sure the dog has a good, healthy body, skin and coat, makes all the difference in the world. So we're two minutes in, and he's already convinced me <laughs> to get a pet. Just get rid of my carpets, and I can get a poodle. There we go. Problem solved. So let's start by discussing the question that I posed in the introduction. I'm a history girl. I love going back and understanding how we came to this situation now. When and how did America emerge as a big pet owning country? Well, it's always big, uh, been a relatively uh, pet owning country. Even when the pilgrims came over, they brought cats with them to keep the rats under control in the ships they were coming with. But, you know, it's such a crazy place that we live. So many challenges, so much anxiety, so much stress. Most of the human, you know, none of my friends walk upright. Let me just state that for the beginning. That's why I'm so close to animals. They're honest. They've never borrowed money and not returned it. They're totally non-demanding. They make you feel good. All the, the studies being done now from, from the major psychological schools say that if you have a dog or a cat and you stroke them, it lowers your blood pressure. It makes you feel good. And you know what? It's just all around a good feeling. It's something that that is 100% with you. In other words, it's like if someone doesn't, let's say, Julie, we go out and have a drink and you don't like me. At the bar, you're going to be nice to me. But as soon as I leave, you know that Warren, what an SOB. You don't get that with dogs. They're honest. If a dog doesn't like you, they don't buy you that drink first. You know about it right up front. So I think that that honesty is really the most important thing in terms of establishing a relationship between the pet and their guardian. And that's the term I use. I don't use the word owner anymore. I use the word guardian because we don't own them. How do you own something that's alive? You, you're a guardian for them. Mm. Do pets have natures? I know that you're saying that they're honest because animals, at least in my view, don't have the capability to be dishonest in, in the way that humans do. But I, I'm asking you because, as I said, I don't have a pet. I don't know this for myself. But are some dogs more energetic or sweet than others? Are some dogs moody? Can you tell the disposition of an animal? Dogs take on the personality of the people they live with. I'm going to give you, I'm going to drop some names. Can I drop some names? Drop them. Okay, Lily Tomlin. I trained her dog many years ago. She had a little dog named Tess. I started working with the dog, and then 
as I got to know Lily and the dog, I realized the dog had multiple personalities. Remember the book Sybil with all the, the woman had all the personalities? That was Lily's dog. And then I started analyzing and say, why? Then I realized that Lily practices two to three different personalities every day, or at least she did back then. So therefore the dog was confused in terms of who is the real Lily. So they definitely take on the person. Rodney Dangerfield was a client of mine. I'm telling you, if his dog could stand up on its hind legs, it would be doing stand-up comedy. So they really do take on the personality. I can tell, you don't have a pet right now, Julie, but if you had a dog or a cat, and I would spend five or 10 minutes with that dog or cat, I would know more about you than you would ever want me to know. Wow. So, so how? How does that work? Well, you can watch the way the dog is. Is the dog a little shy? Is the dog outgoing? Is the dog fearful? Is the dog timid? And then it usually relates directly to the people. But here's the problem. The average family, husband and wife, for example, these are the calls I get on my show. Warren, my dog's driving me crazy. He's jumping on the couch all the time when I'm sitting there. And I explain to them, what happens is the husband tells the dog to jump on the couch. The wife tells the dog to get off the couch. The dog calls me on the phone to say, hey, Warren, isn't that the definition of neurosis? So I think the most important thing, if you have a dog, is to be consistent. For example, my dogs sleep in bed with me. Many dogs sleep in bed with me. And the bottom line is that's okay with me. But if you don't want that, that's your option. So you can gear the, the, the training or the personality or what you want to what your expectations are. And let me tell you, dogs will meet your expectations and cats much quicker than most people will. How intelligent are dogs and cats? A lot smarter than me. I go out to work every day. My dog hangs out and watches TV. Who's smarter, me or the dog? <laughs> I, you know, in other words, it, it depends. And that's a great question. I, you know, I trained for many years in Southeast Asia and in Europe. And one of the things I learned is that uh, dogs are absolutely amazing in terms of picking up how we are. And, and they adapt accordingly. Um, you know, I have dogs that I've trained that live in studio apartments and people say, how can you have a dog in a studio apartment? But that person jogs, that dog gets more exercise than a person living in a five acre estate in Texas somewhere. So you have to really plan on what your expectations are and have that pet fit into them. Mm -hmm. You were telling me before the show that the names of pets have changed. Can you say yeah. more about that and why? Yeah, you know, when I first started training, when I came back from Europe and I started training dogs in New York, not that you would ever know I'm a New Yorker. Uh, when I started working with dogs in New York, every dog was like Duke, this is Duchess, this is Queenie, this is Blackie, this is Whitey. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, people call me up on the show and they'll say, you know, Warren, my dog's name is Sam or Harry or Sue or Joan. And the, the concept is people are giving their pets human names because they're now accepting them as part of the family. As a matter of fact, you know, someone called not too long ago and they had a dog named Sam and he was going out to play with his friend's dog named Billy. It was like a poker game on a Friday night because of the name. So the bottom line is, yeah, dogs do, uh, they do reflect that. And the names that people give their dogs is indicative of their relationship with their dog. It seems that the pet is taking a, a more human-like role at least to me, that's what, what the, the human names w would indicate. Uh, I may be a little eccentric. Uh, I, I've never been called that. But if, if people were just as close or just as honest or just as real as pets, um, maybe we'd be closer to humans as well. Mm. People are closer to their pets. First of all, you can tell your dog or cat anything. Who are they going to tell? Tell them whatever secret you want. Tell them your bank account. Tell them your, your, your password. They don't care. So I think it's that relationship, that non-demanding relationship, that honest relationship, the trusting relationship, the fact that there's an unconditional love for the people that they live with. I mean, most married couples I know don't have unconditional love, but they have unconditional love with their dogs or cats. And I think that's really, really important in terms of that relationship. Have you ever encounter, encountered a dog with a mean disposition? There's no such thing as bad dogs. There are dogs that have been given a bad break in life. I worked with dogs. Many, many dogs have been pulled out of dog fighting rings, for example, or horrible situations when I was working as an investigator. And the bottom line is, I honestly believe, and this may again sound a little crazy, that no matter what the behavior is, with time, patience, hugs and kisses, and a lot of love, you, and, and a glass of Chardonnay once in a while, uh, the dogs will come around. I've worked with dogs that were like Cujo. 
And it took me almost three months just to establish a relationship with the dog before I could start training. But from my perspective, the dog came out perfect. A lot of people would say, well, just get rid of the dog, bring the dog to the shelter, have the dog euthanized. It's a living, breathing thing. Anybody in my family that has a problem is problems going to get resolved and that including pets. And so many people give up their pets for behavioral reasons that are easily resolved. 80% of dogs that wind up at shelters wind up there because they're jumping, chewing, barking, not housebroken, not because of aggressive behavior. You keep dropping uh, references to your past. I should have opened the interview by asking you to give us a little bit of a synopsis. You said you were an investigator. I know you were on the Today Show. How did you get interested in this line of work? I have always been an animal fanatic. I grew up on Long Island, and basically the whole family would come out. And it was too many people for me. Behind my parents' house was a little creek with rats and muskrats and ducks. That's where I hung out. Um, and my entire, from the time I was 14, I would work at animal shelters. I would volunteer here. I would volunteer there. And then when, uh, when I enlisted in the service, maybe not the smartest move I have made. It was a smart move. I learned an awful lot. I trained for years in Southeast Asia. I studied at the University of Frankfurt. I trained dogs for the, uh, the German police department, the Belgian police department, really advanced training. And then I came back to the United States. There was no such thing as animal psychology. So I took an ad, I took a job at a, at a dry cleaner. And I said to my wife at the time, I said, you know, Faye, I have stuff that people need, but how do I get that info out there? This is a true story. It's on my desk right now. I took an ad in a local penny saver, said, we'll teach your dog Yiddish for $15. Sounds stupid. It does. <laughs> people called and I would go to your house and for 15 bucks, I would resolve any problem you had. So the press started coming at me on Long Island, the uh, Newsday, and then some of the news people and celebrities. And it just built up nothing I ever planned on. I used to be a shy kid from Long Island. So it's nothing I planned on. It just happened. I've written 11 books. I did a, 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 I was the creature keeper on the Mickey Mouse Club, the new Mickey Mouse Club. I can't look at my Mouseketeers now because they're all beautiful women and I knew them when they were 11 and 12 years old. And then I did a show called Our Magazine, Regis and Kathy Lee for 15 years, the Today Show, and a few more things besides that. And I've been on the radio for 43 years. I love what I do because it gives me the opportunity to look at life from the dog or cat's point of view, not just the human point of view. Can you say more about that? What is life like from the dog or cat's point of view? Life, you're everything. You're everything. You know, you're in charge. You feed them, you walk them, you play with them, you cuddle them, you hug them, you kiss them. So from a dog's perspective, you're like God. You know, it's like, it's amazing. Sometimes I'll walk into the house and I'll walk in with some gifts for the dogs uh, and, and they'll look at me like, like I'm God. Where did they come from? Where did this come from? So yeah, they, <laughs> it's like that, that, that total relationship that's so different. Um, I have worked with over 40,000 different pets. That's a Guinness wow. quote, not my quote. And, and, and by doing that, uh, Julie, I've come to the opinion that that dogs are just, and cats and birds, whatever type of pet you may have, um, are just the icing on the cake when it comes to life because they just, who else? Who else is that close to you? Who else? I mean, you can get up in the morning, you can have bad breath, no makeup on, you can look lousy, you can feel lousy, but you know what? Your husband may care, your girlfriend or boyfriend may care, your dog could care less what your breath smells like, he just wants to be close to you. You said that you trained investigative dogs. What are the capabilities of those dogs and how do you train them? Well, you know, I, when, when Ground Zero happened, when the attacks happened, I was living in Santa Monica and I got a call from the NYPD canine unit in New York because of my expertise. My expertise was teaching dogs to sniff out drugs and bombs. I always joked that I, I knew where the best drugs were and the bombs were, so I was safe. <laughs> but they called me in, and so there were no planes. I hopped in my 1992 Explorer, drove 3,000 miles to New York, uh, to the, to, and worked with their dogs there. These dogs are so amazing. They're so incredible, not just the, the, the dogs that were working at Ground Zero and search and rescue dogs, but dogs in general. Now, when I was talking about Julie, peace officer, and I was a peace officer, I worked for the state of New York, worked, it was a volunteer basis, had to carry a gun 24 hours a day, had to go investigate all different types of animal abuse. You know, I closed down circuses, I closed down rodeos. Uh, I was just telling someone this story the other day. There was a big motorcycle gang on Long Island called the Pagans. I'll never forget the name. And they, were ha they had this pit bull, and the neighbors were complaining about this dog. They're mistreating the dog, blah, blah, blah. 
So I went there to investigate. I got to be honest with you. I was a little scared. This is a big biker gang here. And I went there to investigate. And someone opened the door and, and he said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm from the League for Animal Protection here to investigate. He says, you're an animal cop, which made me a little bit more nervous at that point. But it turned out these were great people. I don't know about great people, but they were good with the dog. It was a nuisance complaint. So I investigated all types of complaints, abuse complaints, where, where dogs were dying and cats were dying and people were mistreating them. And, and it just made me closer to the animals than I've ever been. So yeah, that was a volunteer basis. I did that for many, many years just as a volunteer because there was no one else that was willing to go in and investigate these horrible abuse cases because generally people that abuse animals abuse people as well. I should know my facts about this before I, I ask you, but I, I'm sure you'll be able to correct me. I read somewhere that there is a seemingly reverse correlation between the way that people treat their dogs and sometimes the way they treat other people. Like sometimes the, the, the greatest murderers on death row actually are very kind and affectionate to the pets that they own. Are you aware of this or did I just grab it somewhere? It, it goes the to the other end as well, Julie. Let me give you the other perspective. In the research that was done with people like Jeffrey Dahmer and all these mass murderers, they all started out abusing animals before mm. they started abusing people. That would probably so from make that sense. aspect of it, yeah, they, they, you know, I remember that Jeffrey Dahmer, I did some research on him years ago, would shoot cats in his backyard with a bow and arrow and then put them in his freezer. And so many oh, people God. abuse animals. Yeah, so it's, it's um, usually they start out abusing animals and then they graduate to abusing people. However, I've also worked with, uh, with some amazing people that you would think, you know, uh, boxers, fighters, uh, people that you would think of as assertive, aggressive people. And yet, and yet, when you go into their homes, they're pussycats, no pun intended, with their dogs or their cats. Uh, one of my clients, and, and, and again, she's no longer with us, but one of my greatest friends, um, no, I don't want to mention her name, but anyway, she had this great dog. She had this, this, this super dog. And that dog was her whole life. And, and, and she had such an incredible career. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro, she ran for vice president, the first woman to run for vice president. She had this German shepherd and the dog's name was Max. And while she was on the campaign trail, um, what she would do is to come home and relax, she would take her dog's paw print and send letters to her friends. So her dog gave her the opportunity on the campaign trail to just be her dog. Now here's a high powered woman, totally insane, going crazy, trying to win the vice presidency. And the only relief she had was when she was home with her German shepherd, Sammy, who calmed her down and made her feel good about herself mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. So what is the ideal life of a dog? Let's go through diet, interaction with humans, interaction with animals, play, toys, Give me the utopian life of an American pet. Moving into Canine. my house. Moving into my <laughs> oh, house. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I bet moving into your house would be the utopian uh, you know, life. It's, it's being loved. It, it's a matter of educating. You know, people use this term training. I guess training is okay, but educating the dog. More people spend time telling the dog no than teaching the dog what's right or wrong. I joke that I go into people's homes and you say no and the dog comes thinking that's his name. It's kind of like it becomes like white noise to a dog. So taking the time to to educate the dog, what's good for you? I don't care if your dog does backflips. As long as he comes when you call him, he sits and he stays, he's not jumping on people, that's good enough for me. Whatever your expectations and your wants are, that's the educational. But it has to be done in a positive way. In other words, if you're losing your temper, go away. Come back at it another day. The bottom line is never get angry when you're training, you're working with your dog or educating. Walk away, come back. So education is important. If you can't do it yourself, there's amazing classes and trainers out there. In terms of diet, here's the big thing. Most people feed their dog once a day. And then they call me and they'll say, Warren, my dog's chewing up the chair. He's doing this. He's scratching this. He's hungry. You can get all your nutrition from a pill. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be hungry. So I recommend if you have a dog, you feed them several small meals. If you can, three meals a day. If that's too much, two meals a day. Not more food. We don't want chubby puppies running around. So in other words, feeding your dog is important. You know, my mother always had dogs that were overweight, although she would never admit it. I came from a Jewish family, so there's no such thing as overweight. We were all just big boned uh, when we were growing up. So the condition of your dog, if your dog is gaining a little weight, you got to cut back, increase the exercise. Good, healthy weight for your dog is just as important as good, healthy weight for people. 
But here's the thing that's important. Most dogs don't get sufficient exercise. Entire dogs sleep. They don't pee in the house. So make sure your dog or, or your cat for that matter, but dogs primarily are getting a good amount of exercise. Puppy push-ups, doggy sit-ups. Um, you, I wrote a book called Pet Aerobics many years ago. They called me the, the Jane Fonder of the pet world. And the reason for that is people could, people won't admit it, but they do it. People, when a good song comes on the radio, I guarantee you Sean dances with his dog. I guarantee you everyone, when their song comes on the radio, they'll pick up their dog's feet or they'll just dance around with the dog. Uh, they'll play with the dog. So that exercise factor, whatever you want to do, if you're a jogger, build your dog into it gradually. My dog does push-ups because I do push-ups. So the bottom line is exercise is critical and mental stimulation. As our dogs get older, well, we trained our dog when he was a puppy. We left him alone. That's not good enough. You learn every day. I learn every day. So even if you have a dog that's that's going through its midlife crisis, which they do, by the way, or you have a dog that's a little bit older, make sure you keep that mind really stimulated. That will resolve a lot of issues that you may be having. So good diet, good exercise, common sense, mental stimulation, and a good relationship with your vet. That's what it takes. How do you keep the mental stimulation up? And what is it like for a dog to go through a midlife crisis? Well, when they go through a midlife crisis, they get all this great attention when they were a puppy. Everyone came to that. Oh, wow, let me play with the puppy. Oh, look how cute he is. Grandma and grandma would come over. Aunt and uncle would come over, bring the puppy toys. Now he's two or three years old, the same old dog. So it becomes a little boring. You got to keep that stimulation there. So what happens is what you can do is if you normally walk the dog around one neighborhood, take him to another neighborhood. Uh, if you, if you, my backyard, for example, if you were to go to my backyard, People call me up all the time, Joe, and say, how do I stop my dog from digging? You can't stop a dog from digging, but you can't teach him where to dig. If you go into my backyard right now, there's two kiddie pools back there. And in the kiddie pools, I filled them with dirt and sand, and I put the dog's toys in there. And I went in there and teased them, like, look at me, daddy's in it. And now, when they go into the backyard, they go to their little kiddie pools. It's kind of like their own sandbox. And I can grow my petunias. And my dogs don't dig because they have their own place to dig. So that's what I mean in terms of being able to, to analyze what needs your dog may have. I have a tetherball in my backyard. My dogs love to play tetherball. I change that. I rotate their toys. For example, you might go out and spend 100 bucks on a scratching post for a cat. You think the cat cares how much you spend? No. Go out to the supermarket, buy a cardboard box, or get one for free, bring it into the house. It's like kitty nirvana. So even with cats, cardboard boxes, paper bags, changing things all the time really makes all the difference in the world. Even throw parties for your dog or, or having people that you walk with your dog all the time. You know, there are times, this may sound chauvinistic and I don't mean it to be. There are times women have to speak to other women. There are times men have to speak to other men. Of course. You know what? There are times that dogs have to hang with other dogs. Do cats deserve the stereotype or reputation that they've earned as sneaky, uh, kind of uh, cunning animals? I, I have to say, when I look at a cat, I'm a little bit afraid. When I look at a dog, I totally trust a dog. A cat gives me the creeps a little. Is that wrong? Absolutely. I love talking to you because you're so wrong about cats. I love it. Listen to me. <laughs> really? Listen to me. Cats are so smart. They convinced people like you that you can't do anything with them. So we just leave them alone. My cats walk on a leash and harness. Uh, it's just the way they are. Cats are amazing animals. Just that a lot of people don't spend the time. So, you know, one of my best selling books, How to Get Your Cat to Do What You Want, is talks about the concept of, of building up your cat's self image, building up their confidence, socializing them. Here's a prime example cats are nomadic by nature. They love to go outside and roam, but it's coyote time. We can't let our cats outside. So you need to make the inside outdoor interesting. Grow organic plants, those cardboard boxes. You want to give cats the opportunity to be cats. Cats love high places. So, you know, give them places to go up high. Cardboard boxes, one on top of the other. Make a kitty condo, a duplex, a triplex, whatever you want to do, and then throw those boxes away. Remember, every box that comes into the house for your cat, one smells like fish, one smells like lettuce, can make all the difference in the world. So the same thing. A lot of people misunderstand cats because they think, oh, that's a cat. They just do what they want. If you treat your cat, socialize and expose the same way you do with a dog, you're going to get the same results with your cat. There's so much more to talk about. I could talk to you for hours. You are so funny and fun and not to mention knowledgeable. But 
just to end, we've been talking a lot about dogs, a little bit about cats. Okay, you've, you've proven me wrong. I will re reconsider my bias against cats. Let's talk about some other fun pets that people have. Fish, birds. I've even uh, encountered people who have lizards, horses. Some people have horses. Can you talk a bit about those pets? And what would you say is the best pet, alternative pet to have, i.e. not dog, not cat? If, if you take the time to educate yourself and understand the type of pet you're going to be getting, whether it be a horse. I mean, I had pet tarantulas when I was a kid or a spider or a snake or a bird, uh, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. If you take the time to really educate yourself and know what the needs of that specific animal are. Uh, for example, I often recommend for children uh, a guinea pig. I think guinea pigs are great. You put a little pool, they can, they can, you know, a dry pool, they can walk around in it, gives kids the opportunity to hold them and groom them and clean up after them. It's a great opportunity. So from that perspective, uh, hamsters are fine, gerbils are fine, but I think the best way to start if you have a child is perhaps with a guinea pig. They're a little larger, a little easier to handle. Now, in terms of reptiles, some people are just turned off by reptiles. Um, there's a, a certain types of lizards uh, that people can have as pets. But again, I feel bad for the lizards because people will go to the pet store and they'll buy one and that's the end of it. They don't know what to do and then the, the lizard winds up dying. So if you educate yourself, that's fine. Now fish, probably, you ready for this, Julie? Fish, probably the most abused animal in America. People go out, they get a goldfish, they put it in a tank of water, it stays in there for a year, two years, five, whatever, and then it dies. It's the same tank of water, the mm. same scenery, day in and day out. Mm. My goldfish, I stick my hand in the tank with them. I let them swim around my fingers. I change their tank the way it's done. I put maybe this on one side, and then I'll get a new thing and put that on the other side. Keeping them mentally stimulated the way they would be in the wild makes me happier my fish live a little bit longer than most anyway. So no matter, even horses, no matter what type of pet you have, educate yourself. Yes, I do kiss my fish, Julie. I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy. I do kiss my fish. Every living thing needs affection. Gosh, you are right. I, I have to tell you, it's bringing back a memory. When I was little, I had a fish, and I don't think I took very good care of it. And right. to this day, I, I feel guilty. I just had to <laughs> Put that out there. Uh, you're you're right. You're really right. I can I can see how fish are the are the most abused. Maybe they are the ones that, that shouldn't be pets. You know, well, no, it, in the wild. If you treat them properly, if you set it up properly, they right. find birds. People go out and let's say you went out and bought a a, a, a parrot today, a, a blue and gold macaw. Oh, I love this bird. Look how gorgeous he is. He's smart. He talks. He does this. He does that. Five languages. Do you know that bird's going to be around for 75 or 85 years? You're going to have to set up a living trust because chances of you living beyond that bird are slim to none. So all these things have to be taken mm. into consideration before you decide what type of pet fits your lifestyle. Warren, it's been such a joy having you on the program. I hope to have you on again soon in person because I found out that you're in L.A. And I would like to tell you all that Warren has just celebrated, what is it, 43 years on the radio with the pet show? Well, yeah, 43 consecutive years. I started when I was 12, just so you know, the 43 consecutive years on the radio. And you know what? I love every minute of it because I have the opportunity to talk about my favorite thing in the whole wide world. And we know what that is, pets. I can tell. You've just given it off a little bit, a little bit of enthusiasm about this subject. No, you're wonderful. It's rubbed off on me. Maybe the next time we talk, I'll have my poodle. The next time I see you, I expect to see some dog hair or cat hair on your dress. <laughs> some poodle just hair. Just in my house, in my house, dog hair is a condiment, just so you know. I love it. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Be sure to check out Warren's YouTube page. It's youtube.com slash Warren Eckstein, spelled E-C-K-S-T-E-I-N. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>